Today we are going to study about spiritualism or spiritism as it is sometimes called. I believe that this is one of the most important studies that we will have together because I believe that this is one of the main deceptions that the devil has and will use to deceive God's people in the last days. Spiritualism is defined as the ability to communicate with the spirits of the dead. And right off we see a problem, or at least I hope we all see a problem here. We have learned that death is like being asleep and that there is no consciousness in death. People do not go to heaven or hell when they die, and the Bible is clear that there is no real communication with the dead. But Satan's very first deception among men was on this very subject, and the Bible has something very much actually to say about how he will use spiritualism in the last days. I want to begin today by turning to John 16 and verse 12. I'm reminded of what Jesus said there. Jesus said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. There are certain messages in the Bible that are intended for mature Christians. You remember what the Bible says about new Christians being like babies and they desire the sincere milk of the Word, it says. But then it also tells us that there is something called the strong meat of the Word, which is what growing healthy Christians need to get them ready for the spiritual battles that are coming upon them especially those of us living in the last days. And of course, I believe that we have laid the groundwork for this lesson as we have studied all these important subjects about life and death and what happens after death. Even last week as we talked on the subject or the misconceptions about hell. But I want to go back to one of our last texts that we used in our last study together it's Isaiah 8, verse 19. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? We're going to see what the Bible teaches concerning this subject and how important it really is for God's people living in these last days. It is called a familiar spirit here, and it says that they peep and mutter, which I've already told you were sounds that the charlatan, the con artists who are in this field, they're sounds that they would make to cause people to think that they had summoned the spirits of their dead loved ones. This peep and mutter is an indication that a lot of what spiritists do is a fake. And if you look at the Strong's Concordance, at the words that are rendered familiar spirit, this is what it says, and it bears this out. It says, a mumble, such as a water skin from its hollow sound. So it's a sound that you make. And then it says, hence, a necromancer, and look at this. What is a necromancer according to the Strong's Concordance? A ventriloquist. That's interesting, isn't it? What is a ventriloquist? We say they throw their voice. It's somebody who makes you think that the sound or the voice is coming from something that it's not. A dummy. Evidently in these days, a jar. A water skin. But a, but a necromancer. Remember that word. And then it says, a bottle. Same idea. A familiar spirit. Now that is interesting. You see from the very definition of the word there, 
that there is a lot of deception built into all of this, right? Isn't that what a ventriloquist does? He deceives people. A good one does anyway. But make no mistake about it. There is some deception in this which is not simple trickery. But it is actually a very supernatural trickery that comes directly from Satan. But aside from the trickery that we, we see in all of this, it is a very serious subject according to the Bible. Isaiah 8, 19 again, what does it say? Should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? So what spiritualism has to do with is communicating with the dead, with the spirits. And I told you already, that would be in contrast to what? Going to God, seeking God. That's exactly right. And so the very next verse, verse says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Folks, the Bible says, If they speak not according to this word, what word? The law and the testimony. What is that? It's the Bible. Very simply put, if you open your Bible, the first several books of the Bible were written by Moses. They're called the books of the law. And in some places it will say the law and the prophets and the Psalms. And, that, and that's what makes up the Bible. But here it says to the testimony, the law and the testimony. If the law is the books of Moses, what would the testimony be? The testimony, simply put, is the books of the prophets. What did the prophets write about, folks? When there was a problem in the church, God would tell the prophet a message to give to his people, and that's the testimony. And so, very simply put, to the law and to the testimony, to the Bible... If they speak not according to this word, what word is the Bible? It's God's word. That's exactly right. It's because there is no light in them. Now let me ask you a question. According to the Bible, what is light? Truth. Truth. Can you think of anything else? Jesus. Jesus. We are the light. We are supposed to be the light of the world, aren't we? But how only can we be the light of the world? We have to have Jesus living within us because He is the light of the world. So, think about this. If we're deceived and or deceiving on this important subject of spiritualism, it is because there is no truth in us and it's because there's no Jesus in us. very pointed but very true message that this Bible verse gives to us. Is that a serious subject, folks? Mm -hmm. Now, that word necromancer, I want to share with you. I typed in the word necromancer. If you do that in, in Google, the first thing that will come up is a definition. Almost any word, if you type a single word in your browser, it will give you the definition. This is what it said for necromancy. Actually, it said one who practices necromancy for a, for a necromancer. And that gets me because when I went to school, they wouldn't let you define the word with the word, would they? But I typed in necromancy, and here's what it says. Necromancy is a supposed practice of magic involving communication with the deceased, either by summoning their spirit as an apparition or raising them bodily for the purpose of divination, imparting the means to foretell the future. And I want to draw your attention to the very last line up there. It says, to foretell future events or discover hidden knowledge. 
Now that's just amazing to me. For the purpose of foretelling the future or discovering hidden knowledge. And folks, this is the message that we want to warn everyone about in our preaching. This is the reason why we think that spiritualism is such an important subject. Satan uses this deception of communicating with the dead to deceive people with his perverted versions of the future and with messages that will contradict the truths of the Holy Bible so that people are deceived into both not believing the saving truths of God's Word. In other words, to destroy people, right? That people would be lost instead of saved. So this is a very important lesson that we are considering here today. In Leviticus 19.31 it says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. One thing that we learn from this Bible verse is that the attempts to communicate with the dead, they go back a ways, don't they? Leviticus, you know, third book of the Bible, that's way back almost to the very beginning of the history of this world. And God very plainly says, do not seek after them. What does it say will happen if we do seek after them? We'll be defiled, won't we? They will defile us. But look at what it says just a few verses later in the next chapter, Leviticus 20, verse 6, and the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a-whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Look at what it calls this practice here. To go, what? A-whoring after them. God is our heavenly Father, but the Bible also uses the illustration of a marriage where Jesus is the bridegroom and his people are his bride. If we are faithful to him, we are considered to be a beautiful and faithful bride. But if we are unfaithful to Jesus, what does the Bible consider us? A worldly and adulterous bride. Adultery being the act of a cheating wife, right? But there's several times in the Bible when it even goes further than to say an adulterous wife, the obvious, ugly extreme of this illustration of an unfaithful woman is what we call a whore, a harlot, a prostitute. A woman that is so unfaithful that she does it for a living, right? And it says that if we are like that, what will he do? He will set his face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. In Deuteronomy 18, 10, and 11, There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Now that's a big long list of words that we don't commonly use, but I just want you to see that a consulter with familiar spirits, a necromancer that we've already talked about and defined, look at this fine list of people that they are put in. How does that list look? It says, a necromancer, a wizard, a familiar spirit, a charmer, a witch, an enchanter, an observer of times, a divination or a diviner. But look at the very first one on the list. It puts a necromancer, a medium, in the list with 
one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Do you know what that is? That's a human sacrifice. And actually, it's talked about 11 times in the King James Version of the Bible. It was actually something that was done to worship the false god called Molech. And they would actually burn their children on an altar. Um, if you've ever seen a picture, this Molech is an ungodly looking thing, but it's a false god and it would have its arms out like this, and in its lap there would be a fire, and they would place their babies in Molech's arms, and the fire would consume the baby. I mean, how much worse does it get than that? Verse 12 says, For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Folks, he doesn't say that he doesn't like it. He says he hates it. He says it's an abomination. And how could we come up with anything worse than sacrificing, burning your little child to death as a sacrifice for a false and evil God. 2 Kings 21, verses 1 and 2 says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Hephzibah and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. We're drawn to the words that Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. Because that's kind of shocking to our minds that a 12-year-old boy could, could uh, take the throne and be the king of any nation. But I also would remind you that there's another child king in the Bible. His name was Josiah, and he started to reign when he was only 8 years old, didn't he? Now, it's really interesting. These are the only two relatively small children we know of that took the throne when they were so young. And Josiah, the Bible says, was one of the best kings that ever reigned in all of Israel. Manasseh, it says, something entirely different. But I want to point your mind to this. While he was 12 years old when he began to reign, it says that he reigned for 55 years. So at some point, Manasseh is a 67-year-old man, right? And the statement that the Bible makes about his reign is not talking about when he's 12. This is the, the summation about his entire reign that the Bible is talking about here. And what does it say about him? It says he did that which was evil in the sight of God after the abominations of the heathen. Well, what did he do? Look at verse 6. It said, He made his son pass through the fire and observed times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Now I challenge you, if you compare that with the list that we just looked at a moment ago, everything on this list was in that other list. Every single one of them. Making his son pass through the fire in the worship of Molech, one of the false gods of the nations around them. It also says that he consulted mediums and familiar spirits and that this provoked God to anger against him. And I want to remind you of a verse that we read last time, Revelation 21.8. It says, But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That second death that we talked about last time 
is reserved, the Bible says, for the devil and his angels, but it also says that it's prepared for the abominable. What are the abominable? They're the ones that do those abominations that we've been reading about, right? It says the abominable and the whoremonger and the sorcerers and the idolaters and the liars. Folks, is it just me? Or do almost every one of these terms somehow apply to our subject of spiritualism today? I mean, God's judgment will be severe to those who are practicing all these kinds of sorcery and occultism, but I'm just telling you that all of these things have in common the subject of spiritualism. So we need to ask the question, why? Why does God warn us so seriously about this spiritualism? Well, in Ecclesiastes 9.5, we've already read, the living know that they shall die, but the dead know what? The dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Folks, if the dead know not anything, are people communicating with the dead? No, they're not. So who are they actually communicating with? Verse 10 of that same chapter says, For whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Remember, one of the goals of the necromancer is to gain some hidden knowledge from the dead spirit. How much knowledge is there in the grave? says it right there. There is no device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom, nor work in the grave. If the dead are unconscious, how then can we communicate with the dead? We can't. So if there is no communication with this so-called dead, where is it coming from? And I just have to say this. Be sure spiritualists Many of them, maybe most of them, are deceivers, but not all of them. The devil is alive and well, and this is one of his very favorite ways of deceiving people. Look at what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world... Who is the God of this world? Satan. Satan in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Folks, since his fall, Satan has been very active in trying to deceive men and to keep them away from God. And he has all kinds of tricks in order to accomplish that deception. But folks... Let's look at this verse again. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14 tells us, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Can Satan transform himself into other forms? Listen, if the angel of darkness can transform himself into an angel of light, wouldn't it stand to reason that he can make himself appear as anything he wanted to? Notice what it says in the very next verse, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Who would Satan's ministers be? Demon. The demon. The other fallen angels. Of course, that verse ends by saying whose end shall be according to their work. But not only can Satan transform himself into just about anything, but his demons, the fallen angels, have this ability as well. Let me ask you a question. Do you remember that Bible verse that says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers? 
For some have thereby entertained angels unawares, right? Hebrews 13.2 is where that's found. Sometimes angels appear to people as ordinary people, don't they? And so that shows that angels have this ability to transform themselves and appear as something different than what they are. But of course, the devil, a fallen angel, and the other fallen angels have that ability that they have abused and perverted and used to deceive the people of this world since the very beginning. Isn't that right? In fact, at the very beginning of the Bible, it tells us the story of Eve in the garden. Chapter 3, verse 2 says, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. I know we read that last week. But think about this, folks. Satan's very first deception in this world was the lie that man was immortal. But also, how did he pull off that deception? How did he pull off the deception of lying to Eve? He appeared in a different form, didn't he? Did she know that she was talking to the deceiver? Did she know that she was talking to the devil? No. And so today, many millions of people are deceived by the devil himself or his, or his fallen angels because he makes them believe that the dead are not really dead. More alive than ever, he says. I've heard the preachers at funerals say, Sister so-and-so is more alive today than she ever has been. And of course, he puts her in heaven with Jesus. If they're more alive than ever, if they're up there looking down at you, then it's just another short stretch for us to believe that somehow they can communicate with us. But this is not what the Bible teaches. Last week we talked about another story in the Bible that I want to look at a little, little further today. In 1 Samuel 28 is the story of King Saul and the witch of Endor. Verse 7 says, Then Saul said unto his servant, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. So he goes to the witch of Endor and asks her to bring up the prophet Samuel who had brought him many messages from God when he was alive. And so he attempted to communicate with this dead prophet, but all communicated with Satan instead of Samuel. The following verses will show us that. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. Now we read last week in, in detail the deception that was performed here by the, the woman, but she convinces Saul that Samuel is there, describes him a little bit, and that he can communicate him, with him. Bring me up Samuel. It's interesting the way it's worded. Bring me up Samuel. When in Job 14.12, we've already learned, man lies down and riseth not. Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. We read verse after verse after verse that tells us, can a man come up? from the grave? Can he be raised up? Absolutely not. The dead are sleeping and they cannot be raised out of their sleep. The Bible is so clear and we've read so many passages of Scripture that tell us that the dead are in a state of total unconsciousness. 
So, is it possible to communicate with the dead? Any of the dead? No. But I want you to look at something else in this story. Verse 13, The king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Notice what it says. She saw gods ascending out of the earth. That is actually indicating that the prophet Samuel was now a god, little g. And he was one of many gods with a little g. And that he was ascending out of the earth. Now first things first, how many gods are there? The Bible's pretty plain on that subject. There is only one God. So when we talk about gods a many, gods with a little g, what are we really talking about, folks? Satan is a good answer. We're talking about false gods. We're talking about the pagan religions, aren't we? As we continue our study together, we're going to see that the devil has a false religion that it's full of these false gods. And folks, he even teaches that the dead saints become like lesser gods. And so folks, I think this story in 1 Samuel 28 is a very important one. In verse 15 it says, And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? Do you notice it keeps saying, Bring me up, bring me up. Samuel, and Samuel says, why did you bring me up? When the Bible, in those exact same words, says once he goes to his grave, he will never come back up. The medium said, who shall I bring up? The spirit that she presents to Saul says, why did you bring me up? But what does the Bible say? Over and over and over again, as the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. The Bible is so plain, and it says it in so many different places. It is absolutely impossible for the dead to come up except for one exception. The resurrection, right? The resurrection. And yeah, Lazarus and Moses, there have been some, some singular times that this has happened. But all of those, the Bible presents to us as a picture of the resurrection at the end of the world. If these people were in if we claim today they're in heaven, why didn't the, the, the Spirit say we're bringing him down? Come down. That's exactly right. That's exactly right, brother. If someone supposedly comes up from the grave, who is it? It has to either be Satan or one of his fallen angels, doesn't it? One of the demons. But in this story, I want you to see what the devil says to King Saul. And then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee and is become thine enemy? Folks, even after Saul has done this abominable thing and he's communicating with the devil, what does this demon power say to him? We have a saying nowadays. We say, kicking somebody when they're down. Is the devil a friend to Saul? He doesn't, he doesn't speak to him any comforting words, does he? What does he say to Saul? The Lord is departed from thee and has become thine enemy. Actually, those are true words. And this is why I've told people before, the devil will tell the truth if it serves his purposes. The devil will tell the truth if it discourages you. Right? But folks, was God... Saul's enemy? You know, think about this. Jesus was tempted by Satan and every word of that sentence was true. It's 
except that little word if. And Jesus caught it, didn't He? And, and we praise the Lord for that. But this was actually a true statement that God had rejected him. God had left him, in a sense. But is God our enemy? Actually, I probably should reword that. Did God leave Saul? Or did Saul leave God? That's right. Is God our enemy even when we're at our very worst? No. You know, it can truly be said that Saul became the enemy of God. But at his worst moment ever, God loved him just as much as he did on his very best moment. Right? And all God ever wanted for Saul was to save him and spend eternity with him. Do you agree? God is not the enemy of anyone. The Bible says God is love and that He's not willing that any should perish but that all should be saved in His kingdom. He longs that every single person in the world that whosoever will may come. But to be sure, while God loves us unconditionally, He cannot approve of us or save us if we refuse His great plan of salvation. Later in 1 Chronicles 10, 13, it tells about Saul. It says, So Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord. And by the way, he, he committed a few. But it says, Even against the word of the Lord which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. Remember, God calls that an abomination. And God says He hates that. So what was the end of this wicked king? He died in his transgressions without repentance. He died believing the lie that the evil spirit had told to him that God was his enemy. And he died falling on his own sword, didn't he? What about us? What about the people of the last days? 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The Bible says that the latter days is going to be marked by a revival of spiritualism and these occult Practices like astrology and fortune telling and divination and etc. Jesus in Matthew 24 4 said, Take heed that no man deceive you. My daddy told me, Don't take any wooden nickels. But how can we make sure that we're not deceived by any man? What's the trick to all this? What's the secret to all of this? Folks, to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in there, right? But look at what Jesus said in this great chapter. It begins, Take heed that no man deceive you. But in verses 24 and 25 it says, For there shall arise false Christ, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And Jesus says, Behold, I have told you before. Actually, if you read all of Matthew 24, I think there's seven times that he, count, that he cautions them about these false Christs and false prophets and these things that would deceive them. And folks, I don't want to get carried away with the application of this verse. But this is really interesting to me what it says here. There shall arise. What does that mean, arise? Shall come up. To come up. Interesting. There shall arise many false Christs and false prophets. If you are a false Christ, 
What are you? An evil spirit. Yeah, we know that's how it would have to happen, but you're, if you're a false Christ, are you not a false God? Kind of interesting. Does this sound a little bit like the story of Saul? Bring me up. It says, They shall show great signs and wonders so that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect and I've heard a lot of people and a lot of theories on what this statement really means. Some say it means that the very elect cannot be deceived. You know, if they could be deceived, infers that they can't be deceived. I've heard people that turn that completely around and they say it means that they will be deceived. But folks, I really believe what this is telling us is that if we know our Bibles, we cannot be deceived. If we know what Jesus told us and we believe it with all our hearts and cling to it, we're not going to be deceived. If we know the truth as it is in Jesus, as it is in our Holy Bibles, we are not going to fall for the deceptions that that Bible warns us about. Right? Now, I do believe that the vast majority of the Christian world doesn't read nor study very well. And so I do believe that many, many Christians are going to be deceived. But Jesus has pled with us to don't, don't let this happen. Sit down this afternoon and read Matthew 24. Jesus says it over and over and over again. There's another statement in your Bible made by the Apostle Paul in Galatians 1 verse 8. He says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And most of the Christian church uses this Bible verse to not let Jehovah's Witnesses in the back door. But folks, this Bible verse is very interesting to me as well. The Apostle Paul is warning the early Christians not to fall for the deceptions of Satan that he would surely try to overtake them with. What does he say? What does Paul say to the church at Galatia? He says, If we preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached, let him, sounds like somebody else, be accursed. Now isn't that interesting? If we, that's Paul saying, if I preach to you another gospel than what I have preached to you, let him be accursed. To me, uh, there is the obvious. Sometimes preachers will preach the truth and then their light goes out, don't they? They change and they preach something different and, and that's a terrible, terrible thing. But could this also be talking about Satan coming and impersonating the Apostle Paul? and trying to deceive the people about what they have taught them? I mean, what is, what is Paul talking about here? He says, though we, in other words, Paul and the other apostles, though we or an angel from heaven come and try to tell you something different than what we've already preached to you, what are you supposed to do? Drive them out. They're accursed, Right? Doesn't that sound like a deception? Like Satan, if he can appear as an angel of light, could he appear as the Apostle Paul? Yes. And he could undo everything that Paul had ever, had ever done. What an amazing thing. What if? Well, let me back up. These things are written in the Bible more for Paul in his day or for our day? 
So could this be true in our day as well? If the dead spirit of Paul were returned and speak to us, I mean, could a thing like that happen? I, I think the part of our world would probably accept it wholeheartedly. Another great Bible verse, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9 and 10 says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. These verse, verses, actually the whole chapter, is about the end time when the dark ages happened first and that man of sin or the what most people call the antichrist power, the beast power, would arise and deceive the whole world. But I just wanted to show you a couple of things here. Who's behind it all? Satan himself, right? And what is the secret to overcoming this power? Notice the ones that perish. Why do they perish? They love not the truth. Because they love not the truth as they should. So, if you don't love the truth, you're not going to live the truth, are you? And so they perish. And they're not... Saved. John 12, verse 35, Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Now we understand that Jesus is the light of the world, and he's commanded us to be the light of the world. And the Bible says that his word is like a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And what John 12:35 is so eloquently saying is that if we do not walk in the light, we're going to be lost. The Bible is clear. Not everyone who claims to be a Christian is going to be saved. In fact, there are religious movements that are not helping people get to heaven, but they are deceiving the people and doing just the opposite. In Matthew 7, Jesus said these words. He said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And then he says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Now I want to submit to you that these are some very curious words that are spoken here. We think of people that are maybe um, not right with God, and they know it. But when I read these words, I see people that are not right with God and they don't know it. They don't realize it. If you are working miracles, if you're doing a religious work and you're, and you're seeing miracles happen in your ministry and you're prophesying and you're casting out devil, devils and you're doing many wonderful works, you know for sure either is it your trickery or is a supernatural power assisting you. You would know that, wouldn't you? Well, I submit to you that there are going to be people that sincerely believe that... I mean, you know, if you're standing before God's judgment as this, as this appears, if you're standing before God and you're pleading with him, wait a minute, Lord, we cast out devils in your name. We uh, prophesied in your name. We've done many miracles in your name. Is that a person that's tricking somebody or is that a person that really believes that they are? And so here they stand before Jesus at his coming and they're saying these things. And what does Jesus say in verse 23? 
Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Folks, these verses indicate that there are going to be professed Christians in the last days who will actually work miracles in Jesus' name, but they're going to be lost. And folks, how can this be? Why would God give them miracle working power if they're not His? The answer is, the miracles don't come from God, do they? But will there be religious people that will perform miracles in Jesus' name and then be lost? Folks, the miracles do not come from Jesus. The miracles come from Satan and his kingdom, don't they? Jeremiah 27, verses 9 and 10. Therefore hearken not ye to the prophets, nor your diviners, nor your dreamers, nor your enchanters, nor your sorcerers, which speak unto you, saying, what does it say about that list of people? They prophesy a lie unto you to remove you far from your land, and that I should drive you out, and that you should perish. Both by using these evil devices, Satan will manage to deceive almost the whole world. The prophecies of the Bible tell us that. This is what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10.20. He says, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devil and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. We better know what the Bible says on this important subject. And folks, trying to communicate with the dead places us on the devil's ground and in such danger of losing our eternal life. And by the way, there are Christians who believe that you can pray to Mary and other dead saints. If Mary's dead, if Peter, Paul, and John are dead, then what are you actually doing if you're praying to them? Is that not spiritualism? What does the Bible tell us about prayer? We've already studied that together. Who are we to pray to? And who else? I was actually, I was actually throwing a trick question at you. <laughs> who are we to pray to? And who else? Nobody. We pray to the Father in Jesus' name but we pray to the Father and the Father alone. That's what the Bible says. 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. False Christ and false prophets, according to Jesus, right? But this is not talking about there being good spirits and bad spirits, and we need to figure out which is which, Folks, this Bible verse is actually talking about the Spirit of God. We're supposed to try the Spirit and make sure that the Spirit we're dealing with is the Spirit of God. Because there's only one other Spirit. Really and truly, there's only one other Spirit in the world. And that would be the unholy Spirit, right? That would be Satan and his Spirit. Many times, so many times, I have heard Christians talking about the Holy Spirit telling them something or impressing them of something. But listen, for a message to come from God, it has to be the truth. It cannot go against anything that that Holy Spirit has ever told us before in all the Holy Word of God. Ephesians 6.12 We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Folks, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. What do we actually wrestle against? Not just quoting the, the verse. If we don't wrestle against flesh and blood what are we wrestling against? It is spirits, isn't it? It is supernatural 
forces. It is spiritual wickedness. Isaiah 47, 13 through 15. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers and the stargazers and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. This is almost like something that would have been said to Nebuchadnezzar, isn't it? You know, you're trusting in the wrong people. You get your messages from them. Can they save you? Obviously not. He says, Behold, they shall be who? The astrologers, the stargazers, the prognosticators. They shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before. What happens to the wicked when they're burned? They're destroyed. They're burned up. That's right. They, this list is going to burn in that second death hellfire that we studied about last time, folks. And if we follow them, what will be our end? Same thing. So let's make sure that we're following the only safe future teller. Is there a safe future teller? Huh? It's the Bible, isn't it? And we're going to study about that very soon. We're going to talk about prophecy and how God does indeed reveal the future to us. But folks, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Oh, how we need this precious gift of God's holy word. We need to study like we've never studied before, don't we? I mean, we're coming on some serious things in this world. And the Bible tells us these things very plainly so that when it happens, we will not be deceived by it. And so, praise the Lord. Let's be a part of that remnant group who are not deceived. Amen? Amen. Our next study together is going to be entitled God's Finger.